Hello, CPTI students. Welcome to lecture 11 of Cup and Ur, the Korean patron dynamics in church planting in Cambodia in the context of a dependency issue. Wow. I'm excited. Let's go on with our lecture 11. So Holy Spirit, God, come help us, teach us. We are willing to learn, but enlighten us, Lord, that we may understand and grasp this truth, Lord. That we would really become useful, faithful servant in Cambodia, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, share the lecture. As always, Okay, lecture 11, Baksu. Well, as I always say that I really not only wanna stay at an informational level, my lecture, but move on to inspiration and impartation. You know, really prayerfully attend and watch um, because uh, I'm giving all I've got. I really want to do my best job sharing uh, so that we could really see kingdom of God expand in kingdom of Cambodia. Amen. Um, well, last lecture, it was all about Kapjil. And now we went from patron client, from patron client to Kapenul, Kapenul to Kapjil, and especially Kapjil in Korea. And my personal experience of how someone patronized me you know, and try to use that cup, the power, in a very negative way. Try to force me, try to tell me what to do. And that's what cup and earth relationship should be. Only cup, the negative form, does that. And then my point today is that there is a cup taking place in Cambodia because of misguided mission theology. And that's how I ended. And, uh, and I, of course, always in my mind, uh, hear the objection from people. I should hear objection from you about my claim. Well, how can you conclude that? Who gives you right to say things like that? What evidence do you have? Well, I have personal experience. I am not, not teaching out of what I read. Well, it's included, but more personally. And I brought uh, Mark Noll. Out of this reading, this book, he argues that Korean evangelical Christianity or Korean Christians have been overly influenced by American Christianity. So he's saying that there's good, there's a bad in American spirituality. A lot of the good Korean took it from America, which is good, but a lot of the bad also Koreans took from American spirituality. This was a adaptation from lecture 2004, the 40th anniversary of graduate school theology at Yonsei University. Yonsei University is a large, large school in Korea, start out as a Christian school, uh, not anymore, but uh, so he did a lecture. They have a the theology department at Yonsei and he did a lecture there 2004. And then also I pick up from Jonathan Bunk who is a famous missiologist. He writes in this book, Korean Church, God's Mission Global. It's the Edinburgh series, 100 year series. And wow, he writes, the Korean church's famous stress on formula of numerical growth. Number by growth by number only. And the resulting corporatization made church into corporation, like a business, corporation of ecclesiology has given rise to serious structural and sometimes ethical problems for both churches and mission. Jonathan Bunk. I didn't say that. Jonathan Bunk said, because Koreans learn from Americans, not only goods, but a lot of bads about number, 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 number. It's all about number. Right? And because of that, the church and mission is now committing unethical act. Well, that's a strong statement. Is it true? 
Where did it all begin? Well, it began at Fuller. That's the school that I had experienced. I went to Fuller 1986 through 1999, and then 1996, 19, 1986 through 1989, and then I went to 1986 through 1999. I got my Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry there, both degrees from Fuller. And when I went 1986, they still had this church growth class. Fuller started by Dr. McGavern, Donald McGavern, understanding church growth. He started teaching that at Fuller. Now, what do you see? I did this already in prior lecture. Do you see angels or do you see demons? I hope that you see both. There are both demons and angels in the picture. What's the point? Well, there's both good and those bad in church growth. So it's not all evil. No, of course not. Church growth did worldwide, did a lot of work, good stuff. Well, he had three major disciples. One was Van Engen, and he talked about what is church? And then we had C. Peter Wagner, how to grow the church. And then we have Dr. Tom Wolf, church growth in mission. And Tom Wolf is the one who was doing his PhD in England and left his laptop at the London airport. Remember, he's a good friend. I actually taught one of his class as, as a guest lecturer. So he's a wonderful Baptist, Southern Baptist preacher. All three looking at church growth from a slightly different angle. Church growth? But what is church? Church growth? What is growth? Church growth? What is that in missional context? Unfortunately, if all of them were as equally as influential to the world of Christianity, then I guess we would not be in this mess. But unfortunately, C. Pigner Wagner is the only one who wrote 40, 50 books on church growth. And he became very popular teacher. His church growth and the whole gospel biblical mandate, 1998, that's the book that he used. And then in the book, he already talks about church members as giving unit. Medium income of church members around 16,000 per consumer unit. He started using the MBA, the secular management le graduate level language in his Bible college, which was a huge problem. Um, they talk about Christian as giving units. They are not people in the church. They're just giver. They're just a number. Well, something went wrong. I mean, I'm not kidding. This is actually, that's how he talks about. There's a giving unit and giving per unit is how much. And if you could give a certain amount in our church, uh, and that's the, that's the language that he used. And so now in America, there's a company that approached large church and says, hey, listen, if you're one, one per year, if your income is 1.4 million, we could raise that offering to 2.1 million and we'll break, we'll take the commission off of that. We help you to raise from the giving unit, not church people, giving unit. The people has just become a number. Wow. That's crazy, isn't it? It says it advertised in the wet world. So I'm not ex exposing anything. You could find this in the wet world. What process does your church use to determine whether or not to launch a new multi-site campus and we could raise money for you? This is economic theory, neoliberalism economic diagrams. And they talk about taxation and how much tax the country can raise and that's going to have the consumers so in all this graph this is mba stuff well the church growth principle used the same principle and they just put in the offering there and then we are going to raise that by using all this secular like advertisement very hollywood kind of you know like resort to almost like manipulation controlling people's minds so they'll give more right so sad 
because uh, C. Peter Wagner, he's a great professor, but he's just a pragmatist. Pragmatism is what? As long as it works, it's good. Right? It's the extreme pragmatism. Not the, I mean, there's good about pragmatism. Pragmatism is good. I'm a pragmatist to a certain degree. I do it because it works. But when you do extreme pragmatist, if it doesn't work, it's not good. If it doesn't work, it's not God. So guess what? Some of the pragmatist missionaries did some survey in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and realized, well, it seems like all the Cambodian pastors are very A-dependent. So we're not going to even go to Cambodia and preach the gospel. Well, 20 years proved that None of these pastors becomes financially dependent. So we're not going to waste our money, waste our time on Cambodian pastors when we could invest in Vietnamese, Laotian, Myanmar, Thailand. They all become independent. Why would we waste our money on Cambodian pastors? They will be considered extreme pragmatism. If it doesn't work, it's not God. Right? He's, he's like that. Does it work? If it doesn't work, it's not good. If it doesn't work, it's not God. What works is God. So what doesn't work is not God. Well, is it? It's not very biblical. Okay. So is church growth principle all bad? Of course not. It's good and it's bad. But the negative side, the bad side of church growth has taken over in the context of Cambodia. That's why a lot of the pastors in America leaving the church growth movement, saying that this is not good church. You know, it grows, but is it a church? It may not even be church. Van Engen should have been speaking more. Yeah, it's growing like crazy. It added 10,000 more people to our church, but, but is it a church? Who are these 10,000 people? Oh, it's uh, the members from all the, all the small churches all around. We bust them, we took them out from the, and so we grew, it's growing. Praise the Lord. It's growing, so it's good, right? It works. Work, whatever works is good, right? Whatever works is God, isn't it? Is it? How does that affect Cambodia? When we have people like that in America become a missionary, come to America. What happens when Korean missionaries are influenced by their teaching, come to Cambodia? What happens in Cambodia? That's the question. That is a research question. For example, June 2019, Christianity Today is the magazine for Christian pastors and Christians to read in America, started by Billy Graham. So Christianity Today was started by Billy Graham. So CT means Christianity Today. In the front, a good friend of mine wrote an article in the front saying that, oh, the news from Cambodia was also, also encouraging. Because what? Well, we go and count disciples. See, for American mindset, it's all about counting number. Go and count disciples. How many Cambodians are coming to know the Lord? And they, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We need to count. But when that becomes the main focus, well, he's basing his teaching and Christianity today is basing their thing by Todd Johnson. Remember I told you that $250 book? I still have it in America. He says that, oh my Lord, look, China, Nepal, and then Cambodia is fastest growing at the highest conversion rates among indigenous people. Oh, Cambodians are coming to know the Lord by tens of thousands every year. Really? Who says that? How did they get the report? I don't see growth in Cambodia. Do you? Well, not the report, right? MK 2021. It's not me. It's not white people, not Korean people. It's Cambodian people who did your own survey, arguing that from 2012 to 2017, wow, 635 church were planted. Praise the Lord. And that's what they report. And that's what church growth specialties, special lists, would take and then report, oh my gosh, Cambodia's growing church. Well, they planted 635 churches. 
in five years? Isn't that fantastic? Wow. But they do not report that from 2012 to 2017, 608 churches closed down. So what does that mean? How many churches were planted in five years? Like, I don't know, less than 30? So what's the big deal about planting like five, six? You know, if it's less than 30 in, in two, three, four, five, six, seven, less than 30 in six years, it's like less than five churches per year in the entire country. So how can we rejoice? How can we celebrate? And fully knowing the number of Christians have decreased in Cambodia. They still make a report that, wow, Cambodia is fastest growing nation in the world. We need to exemplify. And then so that my friend could write something like this, go and count disciples. Wow, it's great. The news from Cambodia was also encouraging because they are increasing in numbers. It's all about numbers, 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 numbers. Wow, increasing numbers. But is it a church? So every 11 church were planted, 10 churches were closing down every month. But they don't report that. They don't talk about that as a problem. They don't use it. wonder about that as a research question. You know, I was there when they were presenting the paper. I'm thinking, how come nobody talks about this? They, they just kind of, yeah. Well, there's nothing to yeah about. So there's nothing to celebrate about, guys. There's for how much money you spent, how many missionaries worked, how many CPTI pastors planted in the last those time, 2012 to 20. <laughs> Why are they shutting down as many churches as we are planting here? Come, no one asked the question. Mata Hoshef. Why can't we be honest about Cambodia? Why can't we honestly share that Cambodia is losing Christians? There's no growth in Cambodia. Cambodia is in serious trouble because as many churches are being planted, many churches are being closed down. And so we need to come up with a plan now without any support from the foreigners, that it's time for 20, 30 year old pastors to think out of the refugee camp spirituality, that all oh, the help will come somewhere, somehow. We don't really have to make investment. We don't have to make sacrifice. Yeah, it will be provided. The building will be provided. Our salary will be provided. Church planting fee will be provided. You know, the Bibles will come at free and, oh, it's all free. Isn't Christianity free? Why can't we be honest about Cambodian church plants. That's my research question <laughs> to you, not to me. I'm a foreigner. Because we have report our cop, our client, patron, that we are growing and we are successful. See, we have to show that all that in the number. And so, just like the picture, you know, we, we have to show that we have a numerical growth. Right? That's the, the wrong teaching of the church growth. This is actually a church in America. Okay? And, uh, yeah, we all want to have church like that. And the senior pastor of the church drives a million dollar sports car, Ferrari, and he lives in $10 million home. And, Everybody said, we want to be the, the keys to successful ministry, key to successful growth. Number, number, number. Hallelujah. We worship the number. That's not church. That's not how we need to do church. That's not what Cambodia needs. We don't need church like that in Cambodia. So how does this capture taking place in Cambodia? Well, it starts out in Korea. One denomination leader says, well, plant more churches than that other denomination in Cambodia. So 
So one missionary shared how his patron, the sending missionary department of prominent denomination in Korea, ordered him to plant more churches than the other com competing denomination of Korea, arguing that since there are more prominent denominations in Korea, having less church plants in Cambodia, that other denominations would be not acceptable. It's shameful. It's a shameful that this big denomination in Korea has less church in Cambodia than the other denomination. Wow, it's crazy. The inevitable consequence of such unethical and somewhat child, childish competition are leadership of sheep stealing, busing people out of their region and producing rice Christians. It create a denominational battle, fight over pastors and stealing sheep, but giving, making them rice Christian. I, I shared this with you before already. That is a huge problem. That is an issue that Cambodia is facing now. And it could even be started by CPTI. Are you aware of that? Is there a problem for you? Or is, you don't care. You just want to show the number to your patron, your cop, so that you get more support and you live more rich and you get to upgrade your car and move to a bigger house and guarantee next 30 years. Is that all you want? No, that's my question. That's a research question. Can we be honest about Cambodian churches? That's what's taking place. The super god is Kapjil, not Kapjil, Kapjil. <laughs> and then the other one, well, there, Kapjil by bossing everybody out from, it's happening in Korea. So they learned it in Korea and come to Cambodia and they bust everybody out. And so all the small churches in Korea are protesting Take your busing people. Don't take your buses out of our villages, our city, our town, because the mega church is sending out their massive buses, 20, 30, 100 buses all around Seoul and taking all the members. They fight. That's why a young Khmer pastor at this meeting, MK 2021, young Khmer pastor asked me, why are you Korean missionaries here? giving rice to my people, busing my people out of my village. How can I compete with Korean missionaries church that gives rice and making my people rice Christian and busing everybody from my village, 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away from the Korean missionaries church. He has a million dollar church, bus everybody. And then he calls it, praise God, God is blessing my church. So much money comes in from our patron cop church, so I could give away a rise and increase the number of my church, church growth. It works. I have the largest church, but is that a church? Not everything that grows should be considered church or healthy church, especially for Cambodia. See, when I did my survey in Kampong Chang, I had my little GPS unit and little took moto everywhere in Kampong Cham. Kampong Cham was like, you know, there's 50 people live here and 10 minute ride, there's about, about 120 people live here and about 15, 20 minutes, and there's about 200 people live there. It's all villages, it's small. It's all based on the rice field. So I'm thinking, why do we even need to build a church? You know, if 50 people live here, then we should just do a small group cell-based church. Maybe the definition of church for Cambodia should be cell-based, not a building-based. And call that church. Well, make disciples. Make disciples. Maybe you should have 20,000 small group gathering. I don't know. I'm just suggesting. I'm not saying that that's the answer. What is your research question? How do you struggle with that? How are you coming up with the solution? On your own, not, not foreigners not professors. What does your data say about the future of Cambodia? Well, this just came in. Wow, this is crazy. As I was preparing my lecture, they just sent me this report. It's 2020 report, missionary report, published 2021, February 26th. It's just really, really fresh from oral Korean World Mission Association report. Guess what? Introduction. Intro Guess what the second item is? 
numbers. 168 countries, 22,259 Korean missionaries. Where do you think they got that from? Why is that so important? You know, I read nine page report, I'm thinking, wow, this is exactly what I mean. When we are so bought into the American spirituality where, or the capitalistic model where, or it's just abuse form of it, it's just all about number, number, number. You know, what if, or so what if you went to 168 countries, 22,000 missionaries all over the world? Yeah. Is that the most important? It should be the first item after introduction, right? I, I, if I write my report, it will be different because it's quantitative way. It's a quantitative way of doing the evaluation. I would rather do qualitative. I'll talk about the testimonies and how the, 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 their testimony coming out of these people will be totally different. And they actually, then on the seventh or eighth page, they talk about the number of organization sending missionary out to the world at the 22,000. Out of that, 40 organizations, out of the 136, that number you see that there, out of that is 40 are denominations. So there are, there are about 300 Presbyterian denominations in Korea. It's crazy. 300 Presbyterian denominations in Korea. And all the denom Presbyterian denomination came to Cambodia. Thank God, CPTI is a result of all the Presbyterian denomination coming together. In Cambodia, at least in Cambodia, Presbyterian denomination is united. So praise the Lord. That's a good thing. But 40, de 40 denominations out of the 136, 40 are denominations that has sent missionary out to the world. This once again, it's about numbers. So my question is this, well, the next one that I'm going to talk about is how misreading of patron-client relationship in Cambodia, because, you know, patron-client existed in Cambodia, but both Koreans came and misread, misread meaning misunderstood or didn't understand the patron-client, so had a lot of problems, okay? So, uh, and American also, the Western, the Australian, English people, Americans, and and Koreans and Japanese, and they all came and, you know, this relational dynamic is happening in Cambodia and they kind of misread or misunderstood, misunderstanding. And so they created a lot of problems. So I want you to think about this and ask a question. How is CPTI pastors reacted? Is this CPTI pastor's issue? Does young Khmer CPTI pastor ask Methodist denomination, why are you Korean Methodist missionary here, giving rice and busing my people? Or is it the other way around? Is the independent Cambodian pastors saying this to CPTI pastors? Why are you CPTI pastor in my village, giving rice and busing my people out of my village? I don't know. You should do some research. Maybe you should write a paper. How is CPTI church growing? Go to the fastest growing CPTI church and ask him, what do you do? How do you grow your church? If they are passing out rice, busing people, then you need to make a report. Can it be how long would it last? If the funding's cut off, would this way of doing mission or way of doing ministry still valid or still good, still available? If not, what can you do? What can you do? How can you grow a church that it's not depending on the missionary's aid, not depending on foreigners' money, not depending on resource coming from outside? How can you grow? And what is healthy growth for Cambodian pastors? If you're doing church already, how am I growing my church? Am I taking people away from other church? And that's one of your objectives, that's your goal. That's what you're taught to. And fight Methodists, fight Baptists, fight Assembly of God, and take members from their denomination. Is that the spirit? 
Or is it we work together for the kingdom of God? And how could we do that? Well, these will be a great, great research questions. I would like to hear from you. So write to me, and then I could follow up on the subsequent lectures. I pray that uh, you would really uh, pray. You know, um, to me, studying at studying this and prayer meeting is no different. I don't think praying, spiritual activity, fasting and praying, I've been fasting uh, a couple days a week now for God's mercy to come on Cambodia and on to, to the world. And that and teaching you this is no different. It's the most spiritual thing that I could do. Why? Because it is the same. So let's pray. Ask the Lord. Lord, teach us so that we could grow a church that is healthy, grow a church that is not so enslaved by numbers, enslaved by money, enslaved by fame, enslaved by success, but church that Jesus, that you would have planted. Help us, Lord, to make disciples of all nations. Help us, Lord, to become a mission of church. Really, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. See you at next lecture.